you. Thank you so much for coming this afternoon. Thank you to Buffalo Street Books, as always, for being the literary heart and soul of this community and being just the easiest organization in town to work with and organize events. It's true. Become a member, everyone, because they depend on you. My name is Leslie Williamson. I serve as the executive director of the Salton Stahl Foundation for the Arts. We're a small arts colony. We provide arts residencies fully funded arts residencies for poets, writers, photographers, visual artists, filmmakers, playwrights during the summer months and subsidized retreat space during the rest of the year. And the reason that I'm up here and the reason that we're hosting this reading is that the poets who will be presenting their work to you this afternoon are both alums of the residency program. Sally was a juried fellow in 2014, immediately after earning her MFA at Cornell, and Ocean was an alum from the prior year, 2013. So this is our way of sort of presenting our alums from Salt and Stall to you, because we're part of this community also, and it means a lot to us to do this with you. So thank you for coming. Sally Wen Mao is the author of Mad Honey Symposium, which was published by Alice James Books. It was a Poets and Writers Top 10 debut of 2014. Her second book, Oculus, is forthcoming from Grey Wolf Press in 2019. Her work has won a 2017 Pushcart Prize and is anthologized in the Best of the Net 2014 and the Best American Poetry of 2013. Recent poems are published or are forthcoming in A Public Space, Poetry, Black Warrior Review, Guernica, the Missouri Review, and Tin House, among other journals. The recipient of fellowships and scholarships from Kundiman, Breadloaf Writers Conference, Jerome Foundation, Hedgebrook, Vermont Studio Center, and Salt and Stall in 2014. Sally holds an MFA from Cornell University and has taught writing at Cornell and at Hunter College. She is currently a Coleman Center Fellow at the New York Public Library in Manhattan. Please give a warm welcome for Sally Wen Mao. God, I've never seen so many people here before. Um, yeah, so uh, thank you, Leslie, for um, giving us this space. Um, thank you, Buffalo Street Books. This is a venue I'm very familiar with. Um, I left Ithaca two years ago in 2014, and um, and so it's it's always strange to be back. Um, so I'm going to start with a poem. I it, This is the first poem I wrote at Cornell, like maybe back in 2010, um, when I first arrived, I, and I was like, what is going on? Um, um, and it's called XX. The night my sex returned, I shut the door, barricaded it with a rotten chair. The banging curdled the egg pudding, and for 10 minutes it was all tremor all the time. There my mother was, half asleep in her gender, and there my sister was, locked inside her purity panoply. And I shut inside, obsessed with the insides of me, obsessed with the open and close of me, dead sexed, hypersexed. I couldn't stop mulling over how every seed burst, pummeled into pulp, jejune nectarine jabbed to the pit. Could anyone forget the horrible panache of fruit? I despised softness, how a bite can sluice the flesh. I wanted to disperse like creosote in water. I wanted to reproduce like spores, tease like those stars seen so plainly out in the thawing sky, but non-existent having exploded long ago. So entered sex who unloaded a carcass, asphyxiated creature into the open suitcase. We shut it tight, zipped it, but the miasma stayed with us, angry visitor, as breath on the cinders, as grease in my hair. Oh my God, I'm still freaking out. I've never seen so many people um, at Buffalo Street Books before, man. Okay, so let's see. 
So this poem is called, what is it called? Honey Badger Duet. Um, it's another poem I wrote here. Um, while I was in Ithaca, I was really obsessed with uh, um, like nature and animals and uh, things that can poison you. Um, and uh, I love the honey badger because honey badgers like they're they they have very uh they have very fearless diets. So that means they eat things like um uh like like venomous snakes and um bees, queen bees and um what else? Porcupines. <laughs> um this poem, Honey Badger Duet. Our father wanted to kill us before we were born. Starve us, stave off hyenas with our youth, our muscle as protein, lion's bait. We drained the flummoxed milk out of our mother who hissed at predators. Her sonic cry could shred raglan to scraps. Now we dance to shed her from our spines. The long years tilt, we bite spleen and anodyne. For all the glory of gore, we imagine ourselves dead, asleep inside the culverts, bald, piebald, very lonely. When the skies meet, smudges the valley russet, and that blood is so silent, we only listen to snow falling on distant trains. The hunger stalks close enough to scoop the pupils from our eyes, and we are danger. We shovel out old clothes from dirt. Only in sleep do we return home from hive coma, disinterred detritus, gulp down the dead. And so uh, when I was working on this manuscript at Cornell, um, I was writing all these poems about honey badgers. And, um, and I wrote so many that I got really tired of them. And I, I didn't really know how to, you know, um, finish this manuscript and and then it, there was a, a little windfall where I found um where I found out about this honey that um that is made from the um the pollen of rhododendron and azaleas and this honey is poisonous to humans and and that doesn't stop humans from eating it and um and and trying to have hallucinations <laughs> so um I found the, the, the kind of bridge between humans and honey badgers. Uh, both species will, you know, put their bodies on the line um, in order to eat this stuff. Um, okay, so this poem is called Mad Honey Soliloquies. Um, okay, so this is Xenophon, uh, 401 BC. The soldiers straddled thorn hedges to sneak a taste. Along the Black Sea, the honeycombs rose like marmalade jars. Laurel, scorched oleander, and honey, that yellow voltage. I tried a drop myself. Some tasted ambrosia. Some heard prophetic hymns. Some cringed at tremors blooming again, youth in their chests, windshorn, iridinous there in the sky, an atomized sun. And me, I got nothing. Just another lonesome breeze, freezing my ribs until my muscles stopped moving. Finally, I spat it out. Like that, my men snapped forward, purging everything. They purged the honey, the oleanders, the olives. They purged the suppers of all the nights they've ever pined. They purged the junipers, the stars, the salt, the seaweed. They purged the ocean, the canker, the long fortnights spent far away, the Zagros Mountains, unlike any hillock back home. Imagine a whole field of grown men on all fours, armored men in full panoply. Even through all of this, I fell asleep, half hoping for a vision, insight, anything. I would have taken intoxication, even gagging. As I led those young men through the waning terrain, the only prayer I dared was rid us of our collective needs. Socrates once asked me, if all memories are theaters, then what can we make of the shadow scenes, the ones that lurk unseen and unexplained? The question came back 
when I saw the dew blind them, and then at dawn they rose like revenants. Um, okay, so I'm going to read a few poems from my um, now forthcoming manuscript, um, Oculus. This is good, this is good, okay. Um, so this poem is a new poem, and it's written kind of in response to some of the crazy shit that's been happening in the poetry world lately. It's called An Inventory of Untrue Names. Um, and I, I guess it's just self-explanatory. The other Sally Mao on the internet is not a real person. She's the pseudonym of Anna Rastorgueva, a Russian artist who keeps a drawing journal, ink drawings of recipes, tom yum soup, beefsteak tomatoes curling on the vine. Anna made this name up, Sally Mao, an old nickname that according to her is a messed up Chinese phrase translated as a little chinchilla. Believe me, Anna, I would know it if my name means chinchilla. Mao, the surname dating back to the Zhou Dynasty, the year 1122, meaning hair or fur, same as the dictator. Sally, Hebrew for princess, to rush out, leap forward, a military sortie. This is my Sally. All my life I've been told to assimilate, take a Western sobriquet replace the names our mothers gave us with Emma, Ashley, Grace. Saved from a lifetime of other people's errors. Erasures begin with enchantment. In 2012, Anna traveled to Southeast Asia, amazed at Asian architecture, unique food, nature, ocean, people that sometimes look like aliens. Aliens. Dear Anna, in Cambodia, did the faces of tuk-tuk drivers register as alien, their brows soaked with the sun and the labor of carrying you? Anna, did you imagine yourself as Persephone, afraid they may abduct you, drag you to an underworld of sense you cannot name? Did you imagine your own kidnapping in a jungle where parrots cannot speak English? Thank us for inspiring you, Anna, but don't poach our names. Erasures begin with names. Araki Yasusada, Yi Fen So, Tao Hong Jing. The trouble with awe is its need to possess the object beyond the object or semblance of an object. A name is a history, a name is a song. In 2014, a poem I wrote was published alongside a poet named Yi Fen So. I, was, I marveled that for once I wasn't the token Asian girl. A year passes, the name is fake. A white poet used the pseudonym he felt foreign, enough to rise on the slush. Michael Derrick shoveling all the dirty snow from his yard. It isn't new. Iraqi Yasusada, fake poet, fake survivor of Hiroshima. Tao Hongjing, fake artist whose works are inspired by his fake oriental identity, all inventions of men who pretend this world doesn't already belong to them. Listen, I hear the real Asian poets sighing as they lower their eyes, read poems about Chow Mein in the latest New Yorker. Somewhere in this known universe, a toilet is clogged with such poems, the ones about porcelain vases, almond blossoms, and drunk Chinese poets. Somewhere in this known universe, a, po a toilet is clogged with Ezra Pound's translations, pages of unreadable ideograms bedazzle the unknown toilet. But the true decoration is the cryptic Asian signature. Now do the real Hiroshima survivors sit unnamed beneath the rubble? Does the real Tao Hongjing shout from his grave? Will the real Yi Fen please stand up? In this wilderness of birches, do we spot each other and hide? Or do we refuse to go gently into Rudyard Kipling's night? Do we dare? Do we do? Do we bloom wildly against our own erasures? Okay. Ugh, sorry. Um, so, yeah, so uh, for, for anyone who doesn't know, um, 2015-16 was a great year to be a, an Asian poet. 
Um, <laughs> um, it's also the only, like, the, the two the two incidents with Michael Derrick Hudson and um, and Calvin Trillin. It's the only, those were the only two incidences where poetry made the, the national news, like, it made, like, Jezebel, <laughs> and, um, and, and, yeah, I just found that, like, kind of crazy, but, but still, but still most of the articles focus on the, um, these old white poets who either take an Asian identity, um, via name or, or via, you know, uh, Chinese food, um, uh, so I'm going to read, let's see, one more from this manuscript. Let's see, but I have to decide which one. <laughs> okay, I'll read one um, that I wrote actually at Saltonstall. Um, and Saltonstall is a beautiful sanctuary for writing. And I thought, you know, I was, I thought I'd be really tired of Ithaca, uh, you know, after four years of being here. I. I was like, do I really need to go to a residency that's like set in Ithaca? Like, like it's going to be more of the same, right? And then I went there, and it was like totally not the same. <laughs> um, it was like it was like a different. It was definitely a different um, uh, a different place um, for me, and and I was able to I was able to really use that time. I I um, I did two weeks there, and and I wrote things, so that's good. Um, uh, this poem is called The Toll of the Sea, um, and, and it's based on a film um, starring Anna Mae Wong, who is, the, who is the focus of my second manuscript. Uh, she's a, she was a golden um, age Hollywood actress from uh, her heyday was the 1920s and 30s, um, and this film was her first starring role. Um, and it was also the first Technicolor film, so um, so you know the the technology was still new. So they only had the colors red and green um, in this movie. And also another thing about this movie is it's a retelling of Madame Butterfly, which is a um, which is a, a sad, horrible story. Um, so the Toll of the Sea. Green means go, so run, now. Green, the color of the siren sea, whose favors are a mortgage upon the soul. Red means stop before the cliffs jag downward. Red, the color of the shore that welcomes. White, the color of the man washed ashore, from his shirt to his pants to his brittle shoes. White, the color of the screen before Technicolor. White, the color of the na master narrative. Green, the color of the ocean so kind, not leaving a stain on the white shirt. Green, the color of the girl so kind, but why? She speaks, alone in my garden, I heard the cry of wind and wave. In the green girl's garden, the stranger clamps her, asks, how would you like to go to America? A lie soaked in the red of the choke cherries that turn brown in the heat. Red the color of the roses that spy. Red the color of their fake marriage. White the color of the white man's frown. She asks, is it great lark or great sparrow you call those good times in America? Green the color of his departure. White the color of the counterfeit letters she sends to herself. White, the color of their sun. White, the color of erasure. Red, the color of the lost footage. Red, the sea that swallows our stories. Red, the color of the girl who believed the roses. Red, the color of the ocean that drowns the girl. Red, the color of the final restoration. In every story, there is a technicolor screen. Black, white, red, green. In every story, there is a chance to restore the color. If we recover the flotsam, can we rewrite the script? Alone in a stranger's garden, I run. I forge a desert with my own arms. Blue, the color of our recovered 
narrative, blue the color of the siren sea which refuses to keep a white shirt spotless, blue the color of our reclaimed Pacific, blue the ocean that drowns the liars, blue the shore where the girl keeps living, there she rises on the opposite shore, there she awakens, prismatic, childless, free, shorn of the story that keeps her kneeling, blue is the opposite of sacrifice. Okay, and um, thank you for being such an attentive audience. Um, I'm going to read one more poem. Um, it's, it's, this is not, uh, this doesn't belong to anything. Um, and it's new and it's like really raw and like emotional. And I'm not, actually I, I don't write that way. So I'm scared about reading this. I've never read it before. And, um, and it is a little bit long. So this poem is called Obad in the middle of the night. There's nothing a lover can do to assuage your fears. The way we parted, gnarled together like branches. The way we parted with the bottle of Prosecco and the book I wrote with my notes I left in that apartment. The lint roller he used to collect my long hairs from his bed. And maybe this parting is song-like. Maybe it's beautiful, but sometimes I'm sick of living a beautiful life. I just want comforts. I just want rest. I just want assurance. Be kind to your lovers. They're just out here trying to survive the night. Be kind to your lovers. They're just trying to be sincere in the doggone moonlight. Be kind to your lovers. Maybe instead of you, they'll love pine needles. Instead of you, they'll love racing down the track. They'll love foggy bridges and poems by other poets. There was a boy who ran really fast and broke many records, including the record spinning inside me, which was also broken already, which was also a song. He ran so fast and jumped through so many hurdles. In a few seconds, I blinked and he appeared. I blinked and he was gone. One day in Echo Park, in a yellow house that I stayed in, I read a prose poem by Sawako Nakayasu called Love about a butterfly on the track and field team, a high-speed champion, and it reminded me of him, the boy I knew. So I sent him the first stanza, where the butterfly is praised for his speed and his Olympic promise, but I didn't send him the rest of the poem, or the poem's title, Love. In the rest of the poem, the butterfly took time off to be with his girlfriend, and she gets trapped in a bullet train speeding across time. So the boy butterfly sprinter chases after that bullet train forever until he collapses and dies. I didn't send my track star the paragraph about the butterfly's fate, mostly because I knew I would never be the girl butterfly trapped inside the bullet train. I would probably be another butterfly who notices the silly butterfly chasing after a train. And so I become the silliest butterfly chasing after the silly butterfly chasing after the train with the other, other butterfly trapped inside. Migration is a beautiful thing until you grow so bone tired of it, you collapse. Is it a self-destructive practice to feel anything? When is it okay to say what I feel? When will I know if it's okay? How do you know when lightning is real? How do you know when healing is real? The first night we met, our bodies were ferromagnetic and we curled into each other. If I was a hyena, he was a piece of carrion. Or was it the other way around? If he was a hyena, I'd be a piece of carrion too, abandoned by the side of the road, a gold gleaming thing. But once you're done gnawing the meat off the bones of the dead, what do you do with the carcass? You get as far away from it as possible, perhaps a little disgusted with your own hunger. Is it possible to sew oneself shut again after opening? A poet's strength is supposed to be her vulnerability, to find a courage only with a heart pounding full of whiskey. Emotions can only find a safe space in poems. Do I play dead or play aliveness? Silly poems, silly poet, to open yourself to someone is to open a wound you were surprised was still there. That's why I booked the bus ticket to Los Angeles to run. That's why I'd rather wake up in Echo Park listening 
to the birds sing over my ugly phlegm. Our eyes, our lives are carefully curated orchestras waiting for someone to interrupt the music and cure it of its predictability. Or our lives are wild orchestras with no strings. Do I dare try to fill the hollow in my tree with something solid, fertile, like earth? Do I dare try to outrun a professional track athlete with supernatural hurtling abilities? Do I dare chase after that idiot butterfly who will die of exhaustion soon? At what expense? For the sake of what? After Los Angeles, I didn't co feel compelled to come home after the weekend was over. I flew straight to Seattle, where I stayed in Jane Wong's apartment, and I read another poem by Dom Mi Choi. She writes, Everyone is born wanted or unwanted, but some may be born exceptionally wanted or unwanted. She writes, something happens to the wanted girl. Nothing happens to the unwanted girl. I was born exceptionally unwanted, then wanted, then unwanted, until I wanted to will myself a premature death. So tired was I of all this rage. Is my earth always going to be this follow? Motion is my safety against all things that insinuate my worth. I enroll in a self-love course to battle the silence. Here's the thing. Silence is common. Fire and kisses and smoke are common too, as is failure and running and running out of breath and running into a brick wall that has skinned your knees so many times already. What the fuck is ever worth it? What the fuck? Is it worth it? That's what... And that's when I find a butterfly is not a butterfly, but a moth, the kind that eats fire and vanishes. And the moth is not a moth, but a man. And the man is not a man, but a boy running to the farthest reaches his body is capable. And his body is capable of doing so much, including conquest, including ruin, including bring mine to the ground. I do not make the runner out in the horizon even beyond the horizon or beyond the continents. I've been to most of the continents, except Antarctica. Oh yes, I'm a lucky one to have traveled, lucky as a rabbit chewing the head off the lettuce. I'm the lucky leaden butterfly torn to shreds under the freight train. It is this death that dreams my metamorphosis again and again. The lucky ones, the unwanted ones, the track stars, the butterflies, the moths, the hyenas, and the carcasses all trapped together in a room too small to breathe at the same time. So we take turns. Thank you.